been a rough couple of months. The stock market has tanked, a recession looks likely, and the world is facing a major pandemic. However, what we must never forget are the words of our first Prime Minister, Mr. Jawaharlal Nehru. The crisis and deadlocks, when they occur, have at least the advantage that they force us to think. This lockdown has certainly got me thinking of scenario before the lockdown. How India has been home to more than 39,000 DPIIT registered startups so far. The The Indian startup ecosystem was producing unicorns at a rapid speed with multi-billion dollar funding from global investors and also celebrating high profile exits such as Walmart Flipkart acquisition that happened for $16 billion in 2018. However, the startups now in all sectors, whether it is technology, hospitality or finance post COVID-19 are being forced to adapt, adapt to the business disruptions and the vibes of fear. In these trying times, startup founders are constantly worrying about the consequences of sweeping COVID-19 and lockdown restrictions impacting their enterprise and startup communities in India. They are leaving no stone unturned to find a way to adapt and grow in these tough times. Although there has been a financial crisis before, this incident is truly a black swan and can take up to anywhere between 12 to 18 months for businesses to get stable. But I believe this too shall pass. And therefore, to use this time constructively and turn it into a boon, it is important to look for the silver lining. We need to utilize this lockdown period to focus on our objectives and align it with the new forecasted market needs. As for the review and analysis of the current situation, Today, I'll be providing the plan for startups to have a stronger roadmap before they hit the reality again. Our first step in the plan is assess your business risk. In such a time of pandemic, the external risks such as changing economy, demand pattern changes, etc., shall certainly be posed to most of the businesses, except of the essentials, goods, or services. This COVID-19 will bring about a lot of changes, both external and internal. While we can't mitigate the external risks, but can certainly mitigate its effects by assessing internal risk that we may have to face and plan up strategies, keep in mind. Few risks that needs to be assessed on priority by startups are financial risk, operational risk, workforce risk, compliance risk, contractual, risk and strategic risk. Well, now I'll be explaining each in brief. Financial risk. We need to know as a company, what is our burn rate? The burn rate as a term is used by startup companies and investors to track the amount of monthly cash that a company spends before it starts generating income. Assessing the available cash flows for next few months shall help you understand which strategies will work in your favor and accordingly you can plan and implement them successfully. It'll give you an idea whether you have enough capital to go on or you need to put in some extra funds for the business to survive this storm. Operational risks. Operations, if not aligned with the changing economic demands, shall lead your startup to greater risks. This risk could be due to policies or procedures that were implemented before the pandemic in your which if not rethought of or aligned with forecasted consumer demand patterns post-COVID-19 shall certainly deter the growth of your business. Hence, 
it is crucial for you to analyze the new consumer demand, demand pattern. This might also require some startups to pivot, just like Dyson, the British technology company that is best known for its high powered vacuum cleaners, hair dryers, fans, has now started designing ventilator known as the Covent. Not always it is required to do all the things in-house or by yourself. So think of some novel ways, such as barters or tie-ups with other startups. This shall save you time and cost and ensure both companies are adding value to each other. Workforce risk. Startups should maintain their critical workforce. It is the effective workforce that is inevitable for the growth. If you're thinking of cutting down on the workforce, then you may want to think twice. Decisions of cutting down critical workforce in haste might turn out to be a bad decision legally and for the growth of your company. He might save some money today, but it shall delay the growth in future. Hence, consider other options such as creating ESOP pools for the workforce. ESOP designed by a law firm with enough flexibility can be used to motivate employees through equity ownership. Therefore, According to theory, ESOPs implicitly enhance productivity and profitability of the company. Compliance and contractual risks. In times like these, complying with necessary laws might not be enough for your business to run. It is essential to be aware and stay updated with the new guidelines being given by the government and various associations of the respective industries. All contractual obligations should also be reassessed and if re required, renegotiate it completely and competently right now. And lastly, strategic risk. Everyone knows for a successful business, you need a well thought of plan. But with the dynamic times and shift in demand patterns, one needs to analyze the strategies now, whether they'll be sustainable or not. For instance, if any startup initiated the funding round before uh, the pandemic, they need to reassess whether they want the incoming funds now to be redirected towards product diversification strategy or new product development strategy. Once all the aforementioned risks are assessed, you may find it easy to devise an effective risk management framework that will allow your company to be proactive rather than reactive while encountering the changes and coping up with them in real market after lockdown gets over. Second step in the plan is evaluate financial support. Assess your startup's burn rate and evaluate the financial support required for your company to grow. Various schemes are being launched in India to benefit the startups. Few of them I'll be mentioning here today, such as anti-lockdown loans. Certain NBFC lenders are launching a new loan offering such as anti-lockdown loans to help credit-worthy businesses and individuals to access credit required to meet their short-term liquidity needs. They have arisen due to the nationwide lockdown and forced to avoid the spread of coronavirus pandemic. Few other schemes such as SAFE and CSAS have been launched by Small Industries Development Bank of India, better known as SIDBI. SAFE is SIDBI assistance to facilitate emergency response against coronavirus. The direct, under the directive of central government to provide financial start find financial assistance to startups and MSMEs. The purpose of the scheme is, number one, to purchase any equipment or assets for manufacturing or service. Number two, to purchase raw material or consumables for production. These loans, if sanctioned, are being provided at an interest rate of as low as 5%, that to within 48 hours. Another scheme is CSAS. By SIDBI, it is COVID-19 Startup Assistance Scheme. This scheme is to pro provide interim support to startups whose cash flows and liquidity has been adversely affected by COVID-19. The assistance can be used for various working capital requirements like salaries or wages, rent, administrative expenses, payments to vendors, etc. Now, I'll moving towards the third step in the plan, restructure organization with robust legal foundation. 
few points to be considered here are organization restructuring. To sustain the effects of this pandemic, the rules, roles, and responsibilities of each in the company should be redefined and well informed. Considering the situation today, if the promoter decides to entrust an employee with multiple roles, it should be communicated clearly to the employee in time that downsizing or reshuffling shall also assist the startup in re reducing its burn rate. Data privacy. Many businesses, once they resume offices, may plan on collecting travel and health information of their employees. This shall be limited and employees should not be forced to provide any relevant information. Still, if a company decides to collect this information, make sure the data is being collected and is absolutely safe and in strong privacy. It cannot be distributed or disclosed to any third party for any other purpose. Contractual reassessment. It's not always the counterparties, but there might be a situation that you as a company are unable to fulfill contractual obligations. Review the contracts, especially the key contracts and evaluate to see what protections can you get and risks you're exposed to. There certainly will be issues in supply chains, contractual obligations, as have been experienced in China, UK, and other countries all over the world. Assess whether the circumstances and applicable laws permits any party to assert a basis for avoiding or pausing performance under these contracts. Also check for force majeure clause. Everyone would be having a question if they can invoke this clause and not pay the rentals against their leases, utility invoices can be waived off, etc. If a contract clearly provides that it can be resigned by invoking force majeure, good for you. However, if a contract is silent on this clause or if it is unhelpful, then look at the contract holistically to analyze if the contract can be rendered impossible or illegal to perform as per any other clause. This can also provide a relief in tough times. However, this requires a fact-specific review of the contract. But if you're invoking the contract, basis such clause, be well aware of all the consequences before invoking your contract, making sure it shouldn't jeopardize your company financially in the long run as well. Maintain records and evidences. If you are resigning or pausing a contract, formulate a plan within your company to manage each communication with the counterparties so that even after COVID-19, they're unable to file a suit against you. Legally wetted company policies and contingency plan should also be drafted. Draft and circulate strict company policies to ensure that you have a healthy work culture, keeping in mind the safety of your employees. Few examples of such policies would be health and safety policy, auditing of suppliers for quality testing policy, data privacy policy, hygiene and social distancing policy in workplace, work from home policy. Also, contingency plan needs to be well prepared now. Because let's say if an employee in your company suffers with COVID at work, you need to be prepared for it today. Structuring a contingency plan will save you the panic and unnecessary expense at that time and shall also reinstate your employees and customers belief in your company. While talking out a plan, make sure you answer the following questions. What benefits would you want to offer your employees? What salary would you want to pay or any other relief that you want to offer them? How will you inform other staff members that they may be exposed to the risk of infection? How will you monitor the health of others that may be exposed? Would you let that employee work from home? How will you respond if the news goes in the market and disrupts your company's re repute? What leave policy would you offer that employee? Consider these questions while drafting the contingency plan. Moving towards the last step in the plan, implementation and conducting legal audits. Once the plan provides for risk analysis, procedures, policies, budgets, rules, standards, etc., 
startup needs to realize their vision, which requires a strong implementation plan. For effective implementation, following points, if considered, shall assist the startup. Effective communication. Effective communication with your employees at all levels throughout the company engages them and also helps the management in getting real-time inputs. Employees provide insights into issues, concerns, and opportunities which may not have been known before. Therefore, effective communication with employees not only assists management to come up with better strategic planning, but also involves the employees and builds their trust in the company. Policies and vision. Training the employees with goal metrics. Every business is unique, so are the strategies. Plans to train employees on the job may help you meet the business needs quickly. Quantifying training with defined metrics make the work more interesting for the employees. However, when developing goals, make sure metrics give the whole picture, including quantity, quality, time, cost effectiveness. At the time of implementing these training initiatives, employees' progress should be monitored to ensure that the program is effective. Legal audits. Once a strategic plan is implemented, it is important to conduct legal audits to check whether the practices decided are being implemented by each person or not, and forecasted results are being achieved or not by the staff. A comprehensive legal audit time to time will help you examine a wide range of issues, such as choice and structure of the entity, recent act of the board of directors and documentation relating to those decisions, protection of intellectual property, forms and methods of distribution and marketing, pending and threatened litigation, insurance coverage, hiring and firing practices, employment agreements, trade regulations, product liability and environmental law, and a review of sales and collection practices. An internal legal audit should be undertaken on a regular basis to pick out the potential weaknesses or areas that are not meeting the required objectives of your startup. Objective reviewing of your working practices, practices, policies, and procedures can help to highlight areas that require more work. So now I'm certain that the societal and economic impact of COVID-19 shall be humongous. However, if the startups pull it together and make all required decisions well in time, there is light at the end of the tunnel. So remember that it is in tough times that leaders emerge. Take charge, plan things, and be the leader you were meant to be. Thank you. Hope you all had takeaways from this webinar today. However, if anyone has any questions or want to discuss any matter related to startups in detail, you can contact me on the information provided and I'll be happy to assist. Over to you, Sonali. Thank you so much for such wonderful insights, Prerna. Uh, I would like everyone to take the next two minutes to type in any questions they might have about this session. And we'll start with the next session after that. Thank you, Prerna. All right.
Uh, right. So I would now like to introduce our next speaker. Uh, he, he routinely counsels manufacturing and service industry companies on a vast range of day-to-day -day corporate and regulatory compliances in all elements of commerce and business, including contracts, uh, corporate governance, competition, labor and employment, health and safety, and regulatory compliances. He assists in legal due diligences, audits, structuring of business, entry into India, setting up of compliance systems, drawing paperwork or contracts, and trainings. His industry focus spreads across automobile, aviation, banking, chemicals, defense, energy, food, pharmaceuticals, information technology, and waste management. He is very regular in conferences as speaker for national and international companies. He has more than 150 publications to his name and is a trained mediator and has seconded in multiple companies to gain first-hand in-house experience to add value to the overall business legal advisory services. Please welcome Advocate Neeraj Tube, partner at Lakshmi Kumaran and Sridharan. Welcome Mr. Neeraj. Uh, yeah. Can you, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Thank you, Sonali. So I'll uh, start straight away given the limited time that, that we have. So taking note of how COVID-19 has impacted other countries and social distancing being the only effective way to control the spread, the government of India invoked the Disaster Management Act of 2005 to implement a nationwide lockdown in India, initially for three weeks, effective from March 24th, which got extended until May 3rd. Now, based on the advisory issued by the government of India, all state governments and union territories have classified COVID-19 as an epidemic disease under the Epidemic Diseases Act of 1897, giving local administration greater authority to enhance preparedness and containment of the virus by imposing measures such as quarantine, closures, and surveillance. The Section 10.2L of Disaster Management Act empowers the National Executive Committee to give directions to the concerned ministries or departments of the government of India, state governments, and even state authorities regarding measures to be taken by them in response to any threatening disaster situation. Section 51 of the same act prescribes punishment for obstruction against whoever, without any reasonable cause, refusing to comply with the directions issued by the government. And as per Section 71 of the DMA, no court, except for the High Courts and Supreme Court, shall have jurisdiction to entertain any suit or proceeding in respect of any government order issued under DMA. So in terms of Section 72 of the DMA, the act shall have overriding effect, notwithstanding anything inconsistent with any existing law, which means that any law that prevails in the general times will not apply if DMA has been invoked. So we'll now navigate through certain advisories, orders, and notifications issued at various levels with respect to specifically employers that has an impact on employees' health, safety, and other employment-related aspects. So Department Order Letter of March 20th, issued by Ministry of Labor and Employment, which is advisory. So in terms of the advisory issued by the Ministry of Labor and Employment, the public sector and private sector employees are advised to extend their cooperation by ensuring not to terminate their employees, particularly casual or contractual workers, from job or reducing their wages and considering them as being on duty. And if any worker takes leave during the subsistence of the outbreak in India, he should be deemed to be on duty without any consequential reduction in wages. 
and if the place of employment of employer is uh, Mr. Office. Neeraj, I'm really sorry to stop you, but your voice is very low. Can you please uh, either talk a bit loudly or uh, just adjust the mic once? Yeah, is it louder now? Uh, yeah, if you can just speak closely. Yeah. Thank you. So in terms of the advisory issued, the private sector and uh, public sector employers have been asked not to terminate their employees in all categories or reduce their wages considering them as being on duty and if any worker takes leave during the subsistence of the outbreak he should be deemed to be on duty without any consequential reduction in wages and if the place of employment of the employer is non-operational then the employees and workmen of such employment be deemed to be on duty and be eligible to receive full wages or salaries Ministry of Labour issued another notification uh, with preventive measures to be taken to contain the spread of novel uh, coronavirus and prescribed the health and safety conditions that each employer has to provide within the premises. Even Ministry of Home Affairs on March 24th and March 25th issued certain orders for containment of COVID-19 epidemic and they specifically said that all commercial and private establishments needs to be remained closed except for the exempted establishments and time and again they have been increasing the number of establishments that can remain open during this lockdown period and they have directed all employers including industry shop or commercial establishment to make payment of wages to their workers on the due date without any reduction for the period the establishment are being closed due to lockdown or even if they are working as exempt establishment and even directs the landlords providing rented accommodation to workers or migrant workers not to demand payment of rent for a period of one month and also suggested the closed establishments to undertake work from home facility wherever it is feasible Now let us understand the new terms that have suddenly become part of our professional lives. So the first such important term is lockdown. The lockdown until May 3rd has been announced in accordance with the Disaster Management Act. Except for the exempted establishments engaged in the manufacture of essential commodities or provision of essential services as listed in the guidelines, all other establishments are required to be closed down. Most of the state governments have issued notifications providing a detailed clarification on the scope of essential services and the permits or compliances required to continue the operations. In order to stay operations during the lockdown, employers of establishment should be specifically exempted or excluded from the lockdown, either by central government or state government. And at present, only the establishment providing essential services have been excluded from the lockdown. The employees working in such establishments are provided with passes or approved letters that allow them to travel to work during the lockdown period and state governments have their own prescribed formats to issue these passes or letters. The second crucial term that we encompass now is work from home, WFH. While the concept of work from home is not new among Indian businesses, the Indian employment statutes have not addressed the concept of work from home so far. So the onus has been put on the employer to ensure that the employees are not directed to be physically present in the workplace. It is also to be noted that the order prohibits an employer from op opening any commercial, private or, or industrial establishment and recommends providing a work from home facility to all employees whose duty is such that can be discharged from home. The employers have the flexibility to... Uh, Mr. Neeraj, there's still, uh, the audio is still very low. I don't uh, know the reason for that. If, like everyone is requesting uh, you to speak just a little bit loudly. Okay. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Okay. Uh, I'm the closest, I'm closest to the mic as possible. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. I don't know what the issue is. Okay. 
Now, what I was saying that the work from home concept has not been addressed in Indian uh, in labor laws or employment statutes. So the employers have been uh, asked to ensure that the employees are not directed to be physically present in the workplace and formulate work from home policies. An employee cannot refuse to report to work where the employer is permitted to carry on operations unless the minimum standards of healthy, safe, and hygiene to contain the epidemic are not followed by the employer. And the employers have the flex flexibility to specify their own guidelines for work from home. However, the statutory provisions relating to working hours or overtime payment shall continue to apply to the employees as if the employee has been working from the office premises. Now, the third important concept is leave management. Under the current situation, the lockdown have been implemented and the establishments are closed. The absence of employees from work cannot be adjusted towards any paid or unpaid leaves. However, if the establishments are voluntarily closed in absence of specific orders from government, the employers and employees can mutually agree on adjustment of paid or unpaid leaves. In the event an employee is affected by COVID-19 and requires sickness leave, the prescribed number of sickness leaves under the applicable law can be availed. In the event there are uh, where the employer is allowed to work during the lockdown, but the employee is unable to work due to the requirement of self-quarantine because of his personal travel or office travel and coming into contact with an infected person, the employer may possibly require the employee to take his her annual leave or sick leave subject to any specific government notification. However, if the employee had to travel because of work or came in contact with a sick person, the employer may be able, uh, may not be able to force the employee to utilize his her sick or annual leave. In states like Karnataka, the employers are required to provide a longer duration of sickness leave to employees who have contracted COVID. And if the sickness continues beyond such number of leaves, other leaves like casual leaves or earned leaves can be utilized thereafter. If the event of prolonged illness or employees can be provided unpaid leaves for the required duration, unpaid leaves only. If an employee is required to administer self-quarantine as a consequence of discharging his official functions, such employees should be provided with paid leaves for the same. However, if the employee is required to do the same due to his personal action, they can be directed to utilize their outstanding leaves for the same. Now the concept of salary, how it has undergone the change. The central government and state governments have prescribed that employees of any unit would be deemed to be on duty if they are non-operational du during the uh, lockdown period. And as per the advisory and order, the employer has been advised to deter from deducting the salaries of employees and not to deduct wages of workmen during this period of lockdown. In the event an employee has traveled on duty and is unable to return due to the outbreak of COVID-19, it is advisable for the employer to pay salaries and other benefits to such employees. All outstation employees should be considered on duty. Since the lockdown orders have been issued under Epidemic Act, there can be serious consequences if employers do not follow this advisory. As far as uh, the wages are concerned, which is payable to workmen, and workmen has been defined under the Industrial Dispute Act, to include any person employed in an industry to do manual, unskilled, skilled, technical, operational, clerical, or supervisory work, but excludes people employed in managerial administrative capacity or supervisory if they draw more than 10,000 per month. So keeping that in perspective, an employee has the option to negotiate the wage settlement agreement with the union if they have any, and they are directed not to deduct wages, but of course they can take all action or initiative to not increase any wage by engaging into another wage code settlement agreement. Termination. 
Now, the central government has issued a circular stating that if the place of employment is made non-operational, the employees will be deemed to be on, on duty. And any decision with respect to termination has to be taken after analyzing the consequences under these notifications, instructions, and orders. The provisions of general employment laws, employment agreement, work order, wage settlement agreement has to be seen in light of the Disaster Management Act only. Layoff. Now, with respect to workmen, companies have the option to exercise layoff, but for that, they need to put the employees on layoff uh, for at least 45 days and pay 50% of the wages and simultaneously approach the government for retrenchment of the employees and upon receiving approval from the government, they can retrench the employees and pay the necessary compensation as the appropriate government prescribes. Now, with respect to medical tests and expenses, in all the exempted establishments which are operational during lockdown, the employers can test the employees after obtaining employees' prior consent and should have a data privacy policy in place. Employers should test temperature with contactless thermometers. If available, an individual conducting tests should be adequately masked and sanitized. The test results should remain confidential. And if an employee has a high temperature, shows other symptoms of COVID, refuses to provide consent to be test tested, the employer may bar the employee from working based on the employer's obligation to provide a safe workplace for other employees. And the employer can inform the government of india through the ministry of health and family welfare helpline number if any employee is showing any symptom the government has also clarified in a notification that the employer during the lockdown period no employer will be tried for uh, uh, for uh, any COVID positive cases if found in their establishments. So there has been certain uh, uh, rumors going around in social media, but government has clarified that position. However, the establishments will be bound by the social distancing norms and the standard health protocols prescribed. And that is something which cannot be neglected or avoided at any point of time. Now, uh, the other important aspect is what happens to the existing uh, proceedings under labor laws. Now, due to outbreak of COVID, all proceedings in labor courts have been halted and all matters scheduled to be heard from March 25th onwards have been canceled by the labor courts. Additionally, the high courts have also suspended all matters till the end of the lockdown and they have extended the stay orders and directions on the interim orders in spite of the ex expiry of the period. Any inquiry or proceeding that is ongoing within the company, say under uh, Industrial Dispute Act for any harassment or under prevention of sexual harassment under uh, for sexual harassment, they all can continue if they can through video conferencing. However, since physical proceedings cannot take place until the end of the outbreak, the employees may consider undertaking such proceedings uh, after the lockdown is over. But during this lockdown period, if they can, they should continue the proceedings with video conferencing and whatever be the outcome of the, uh, the, uh, the proceeding should be communicated to the parties and ensure that the status quo is maintained until the outbreak of the COVID is over and after the lockdown, the decision should be implemented. Now, the last thing is with respect to the usage of biometrics. There are no guidelines or orders issued which suspend the usage of biometrics by employees. And in the exempted establishments, people can use biometric provided uh, the sufficient health and safety measures are being used. Irrespective, the suggestion would be that employer can recommend to suspend the usage of biometric during this period and uh, this should be done only in light of maintaining health and safety of its employees 
and further spread of the COVID. Now, having said all uh, this, uh, with respect to all these key situations, it is very important to understand that what if somebody goes ahead and files a case against the order issued by the government to pay salaries and wages and not deduct anything and even not terminate the employer of employees. So this, this has been done in the recent past during the lockdown period. Uh, a petition was filed in the Supreme Court challenging the constitutional validity of the orders passed by the Ministry of Home Affairs and specifically Maharashtra government ordering payment of salaries to workers amid COVID-19 lockdown. And uh, with respect to the uh, petition, the petitioner had contended that with the lockdown now being extended, its losses will be multiplied. If the company has to observe these set government orders in entirety, its business will become unsustainable. The orders will have more far-reaching consequences affecting the livelihood of more people than just the people whose salaries have been deducted or employ employment terminated. The petitioner asked the court to set aside the orders of the Ministry of Home Affairs and order of Maharashtra government to the extent that the payment of full salaries was mandated. This, this uh, order is yet to be heard by the uh, court. However, in another, uh, another petition filed in the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court has upheld the validity of all the government notification issued by Ministry of Labor and Employment and has categorically stated that during the period of lockdown, since orders have been issued and notifications have been issued under Section 51 and 58 of DMA, government can initiate action against all companies who violate the directives under these orders. The petition makes a case for the welfare of employees by stating that mass termination of employees and the withholding of their salaries during these severe times is contrary to public policy and directly affecting the right to livelihood of several persons. So it is very important that the status quo is maintained and no employee should lose their employment or their salaries deducted. Now, we are also simultaneously seeing a trend wherein a lot of companies are terminating employment and are also reducing wages. And those actions are totally against the directive issued by the government. So if there is any complaint by the employees or workmen of those companies, definitely government of India and the state res respective state governments or the local labor commissioners will act against those companies. Now, what happens if, because of any economic hardship, the company has to undertake such a decision, take such a call? There are certain uh, essential principles that needs to be followed to establish bona fide so that whatever action the government would take if a complaint is filed, uh, those, those, uh, the company would have some ground to safeguard its interest to prove its bona fide intention while terminating employment of any employee if it is incumbent plus to reduce the wages. So uh, if I have to tell you a few principles, the first, of course, this is the appraisal time and all employees are being evaluated for their work. So it is very important to evaluate it honestly and see if you're terminating an employee purely based on performance and not performance as on date, but performance of the past, the entire last financial year or a few years. And the employee was also kept on PIP, performance improvement program, but could not improve his or her performance. Then that becomes a valid ground of termination. So that, that is something that can be taken as a valid ground of termination. However, not during the lockdown, but immediately after lockdown, that can be initiated. Even any employee found guilty of any uh, misconduct, harassment or sexual harassment 
can be terminated as per the prescribed company policy immediately after the lockdown. Now, apart from this, there are certain other notifications issued by other ministries and government bodies. The first is from the Ministry of Corporate Affairs, which has clarified that the uh, expenses met by the companies or employers relating to promotion of healthcare, including preventive healthcare and sanitation and disaster management, will be considered a CSR expense, expense under corporate social responsibility. And MC has also clarified that any contribution made to the PM Cares Fund shall qualify as CS expenditure under the Companies Act. The Insurance and Regulatory Development Authority of India, IRDA, by a circular of March 4th, had clarified that cases related to COVID-19 are going to be expeditiously handled in order to alleviate hardships caused to the policyholders. The Employee Provident Fund, Government of India, to a press conference of March 26, decided to contribute to the Employee Provident Fund on behalf of both employer as well as employee, employed in an establishment employing up to 100 employees, out of which 90% should be withdrawing less than 15,000 salary. The Employee State Insurance Corporation, by a notice of April 13, has extended the deadline for contribution by employer towards employee ESI for the month of February until May 15. And uh, EPFO has, by circular dated 15th April, provided a grace period of 30 days from April 16th to May 15th for filing electronic chalan come return in respect of the wages dispersed in the month of March 2020. So these are some key uh, compliance requirements and extensions provided by various departments and ministries specifically with respect to labor and employment. Uh, that's it from my end. Uh, if you have any questions, you can uh, note it down and uh, over to you, Sonali. Thank you so much, Mr. Neeraj, for your session. Thank you. And yes, everyone who wants to ans uh, ask any questions, please take the next two minutes to type them down in our Q&A section. And we'll get back to them at the end uh, in our Q&A round. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. All right, so I would now like to introduce our next speaker. Uh, he's into practice for a decade and has worked on various commercial litigation matters with a focus on insolvency, arbitrations, and shareholder disputes. He has been representing various public limited companies and is also in panels counsel for the government of Delhi. Please welcome Ms. Uh, Advocate Angad Mehta. Welcome, Mr. Angad. Uh, 
Hi, am I audible? Yes. Okay. Um, I'm just um, going to start off, and the topic for my discussion today is um, the impact of COVID and its relation to four major. So I think there is there are going to be a lot of questions and some clarity is needed on this. Okay. So to begin, um, as we all know, uh, obligations between parties are governed um, by their contracts. And generally the way the courts uh, have looked at uh, obliga uh, obligations is they've held contractual obligations to be um, absolutely sacrosanct. Uh, sir, I'm sorry to interrupt, but can you just make your screen uh, yeah. on a slideshow mode? Uh, yeah, is that better? Yeah, perfect. Okay. Right. And um, as I was saying, the, the uh, rights and obligations which are contained in agreements and contracts have thus far helped to be absolutely sacrosanct. And there is a very limited um, deviation which has been permissible uh, from rights and obligations which are contained in contracts. Uh, now, outside of the contracts, legislatively, um, the rights and obligations are also extensively contained in the provisions of the Indian Contract Act of uh, 1872. Uh, one of the main exceptions to performance of obligations under contracts um, is uh, force major. Now, force major is not something that is uh, completely new. It is something that has existed uh, since the 19th century, and it has its uh, evolution in French law. Um, so force major is essentially a French phrase, and um, it means a superior force. Uh, this is something that has evolved out of common law that is not statutory law. It was subsequently codified and put into statutory law through various enactments. Uh, the first case that actually came up and dealt with this issue of force major um, was the case of Taylor versus Caldwell, which was in 1863. It's a British case. Uh, and, it, and it was quite interesting uh, because the facts of this case was that an event was to be organized in a music hall and a fire destroyed that music hall. Now, in spite of the destruction of the music hall, uh, the organizer wanted to pursue uh, the contract and he sued for enforcement of the agreement. Now, the law that has evolved out of this particular case, and it, which has uh, more or less stringently been upheld, is uh, that the uh, that the circumstance, which circumstances which are beyond a party's reasonable control, and which impede or render the performance of its obligations impossible, is what qualifies as a force major event. Okay. Now, prior to the decision in Taylor versus Caldwell, there were no uh, force major clauses contained in contracts and uh, the court's general view was that the contracts had to be strictly adhered to no matter what the implications of that were. Um, India, since it has followed the British system, has largely also uh, followed that particular line of thought. However, with the evolution of markets and um, globalization, there has been a gradual dilution in um, rights, duties, obligations, and performance performances of contracts. Uh, one, so one of the ways in which this dilution has developed is the evolution of force major clauses. Uh, now, by and large, force major clauses are divided into two aspects. One is a natural force major clause, which, as you can see, covers floods, earthquakes, riots, epidemics, uh, natural calamities, etc. The second one is our political force major clauses, such as acts of terrorism, riots, uh, embargoes, changes in law, um, changes in government. Uh, now, these political force major clauses are relatively new uh, in the sense that this has developed with uh, the um, advancement of technology uh, and, uh, uh, and uh, globalization. 
Now, as you can see, the force major clauses originally, of course, were fairly simple, uh, but force major clauses have now evolved with the times and they have gone on to become uh, more and more complex. Now, I have extracted for you over here a sample force major clause, uh, which says that neither party shall be liable for any costs or damages due to or for failure or delay in the performance of its obligations arising out of or caused directly or indirectly by forces beyond its control, including without limitation, so and so. Now, it's important to remember uh, that a force major clause in a contract ordinarily should be drafted in the broadest possible terms. And it's important to have words like um, without limitation because this is an indication of how broad a force major clause can actually be. Uh, earlier on, force major clauses were extremely restrictive and parties were held to be limited only to the particular circumstances or events which are contained in those particular force major clauses if they wish to step up, relieve themselves of their uh, bargain in the contract. Now, like um, I had said, this is an other force uh, major clause which, has, um, which I have extracted. Now, if you can see for the, the second half of this clause, it reads for the purposes of this clause, force major means an event beyond the control of the contractor and not involving the contractor's fault. Now, largely the way in which the law on this aspect has developed is that events and circumstances which are beyond the reasonable foreseeability or the reasonable control of the parties in question is generally viewed as a force major event. Uh, so what is the implication of a force major event that can, uh, that can either be contractually provided for, uh, and if it is not contractually provided for, then of course one has to resort to certain remedies which are available under the Indian Contract Act. Uh, now, sorry, just to take you back to the previous slide, if you'll see um, one, one uh, event that flows out of a force major clause is that it allows for a suspension of obligations. But you have to remember that this suspension of obligations has necessarily to be contained in your force major clause itself. Uh, the Indian Contract Act itself does not allow you for suspension of obligations on account of a force major event. Okay, uh, moving on to how to establish a force major event. Now, it needs to be remembered that establishment of a force major event is not only very cumbersome, but the burden of proof is also extremely high. Uh, the person who wishes to claim a force major event is generally the person who has the onus of proof of proving such a force major event lies on the person who asserts a force major event and who seeks to rely on that force major event to renege from his contractual obligation. Uh, one, one of the other very important aspect that one has to consider while uh, dealing with force major events is duties of parties to mitigate uh, or minimize their losses which arise out of force major events. Uh, like uh, for example, uh, suppose in a road construction project, uh, a road gets uh, the particular platform in which the person is working, the road gets flooded and the, uh, the contractor is unable to perform its obligations. Now, one of the requirements that the party that the contractor will have to do is not only intimate the employer that, listen, this uh, force major event has, has arisen, but it is also immediately going to have to start minimizing its losses. That is cut out its overheads, cut out its uh, labor costs, cut out its recurring plant and machinery costs. So it is not sufficient part merely to assert a force major event. It is also important for a party to minimize and mitigate the losses that are resulting from that force major event. Now, um, Coming to the important part of this presentation, is COVID-19 uh, a force major event or not? 
Now, there are a couple of tests which determine what a forced major event is. As you can see, I've highlighted three of them, three of the most important ones, which are one, was the event reasonably foreseeable? Two, uh, was the event beyond the reasonable control of the parties? And three, what is the directness or the remoteness of impact of the particular force major event on the contract and the performance of a party's obligations. Now, insofar as COVID-19 is concerned, uh, of course, there were signs in end December and then there were more visible signs in uh, January 2020. Uh, so it is possible to uh, sort of argue and say that um, the that um, COVID-19 was the impact and uh, the scale of COVID-19 was reasonably foreseeable for parties. However, that takes us to the next uh, question is that if the threat and the scale of COVID-19 was reasonably foreseeable, what is it that the parties could have done about this? Uh, now, now, there have been several notifications starting from um, early February 2020 that the government itself has issued with regard to uh, force major. The earliest of these notifications came on the 19th of February and was is issued by the Ministry of Finance. Uh, and this was regarding the, the disruption in supply chain, uh, where the government has categorically stated that the COVID-19 pandemic would be classified as a force major event. However, you need to remember this is a government circular and it may not go on to have application in uh, private contracts between parties. Uh, the second such notification that came out was on the 20, 20th of March 2020, which was issued by the Ministry of Renewable Energy. Uh, this again uh, was in relation to the disruption in supply chains and the Ministry of Renewable Energy has um, categorized the impact of COVID-19 as a force major event. Uh, thirdly, there was a notification issued by the Ministry of Shipping, which is on the 31st of March 2020. Uh, this again has, while not, uh, not definitively categorizing COVID-19 as uh, a force major event, it has sort of suspended the collection of demerage, ground rent, uh, and other charges which are, which are collectible by ports. So that, as we can see, is certainly an impact of COVID-19. Um, then we have a circular and notification issued by the Ministry of Road, Transport and Highways. Now, this is also important because it's similar to the notification which is issued by the Ministry of Shipping. Now, what the Ministry of Road, Transportation and Highways has done is they have also issued an order for suspension of toll collection. Now, this becomes um, extremely important uh, because there are a category of contracts uh, for road construction and toll collection where there is a minimum, where there is requirement for a minimum remittance to be made to the National Highway Authority of India. Uh, so now that the Ministry of Road Transport and Highways has issued this notification suspending toll collections, that certainly has a direct impact on uh, the contractual obligations of toll remittance. And I will come to how that plays out um, just shortly. Uh, now, in India, the way the courts have actually looked at force major clauses has been extremely restrictive. Uh, now, unless the contract otherwise, otherwise provides for an extremely elaborate and broad force major clause, courts have been reluctant to uh, allow parties to not perform their obligations purely on the grounds of force major. Now, force major is uh, generally contained in two sections of the Indian Contract Act, uh, which are sections 32 and section 56. Section 32 deals with contingent contracts, whereas section 56 of the Indian Contract Act, which is where the crux of force major really lies, uh, deals with impossibility of performance. Now, the manner in which the courts have interpreted uh, section 56 of the Indian Contract Act, starting from the 1960s all the way down to uh, all the way till as uh, late as 2020, April 2020, there's a recent judgment by the Supreme Court. The courts have been, um, have held the threshold of 
section 56 of the indian contract act to be extremely high now one because it deals with impossibility of performance now one of the questions that has been recurring um, is what is the impact of covid 19 and especially section 56 and frustration of contracts and impossibility of performance uh, on lease deeds now these particular issues have already come up before the supreme court and it has been elaborately dealt with in numerous decisions but the line of thought has been largely the same that is the a force major event does not excuse a party from the performance of its obligations unless that force major event is of such nature that it absolutes absolutely erodes the entire understanding or the basis of the contract between the parties uh, so what what has been the general thought of the courts is that unless the fundamental basis of the agreement that the parties have executed is altered parties irrespective of the force major events will be held to be bound by their contractual obligations now it is also interesting to note that the courts have also um, not excused parties from their finance from their contractual obligations on the grounds of financial hardships now this assumes uh, importance especially in these times because as someone had indicated the markets are in uh, a complete turmoil there is no income being generated and therefore how are people um, required to pay their leases or uh, salaries now, as far as salaries are concerned of course there are numerous government notifications uh, but as far as leases are concerned this actually becomes a cause for concern because uh, this will perhaps be need to look at again at least the supreme court decisions that have earlier dealt with um, uh, leases and holding them not accountable to force major events will seriously seriously now in the present circumstances need to be reconsidered uh, what we also need to consider when we are um, resorting to force a force major clause in a contract or section 56 of the indian contract act is the link between the obligation or the contract and the force major event now one of the fundamental principles uh, that we need to understand is that the force major event has to have a direct impact on the obligation that is being performed now for example if you just have the previous point on this very slide uh, construction contracts and road development contracts where say a flood dest destroys the entire road uh, in such circumstances the force major clause or section 56 of the the uh, contract of the indian contract act can be invoked because the fundamental basis for the contract itself has fallen away that is the construction of the road and therefore it is impossible for a party to perform its obligation in these circumstances a force major uh, section 56 of the indian contract act could be invoked uh, now as i had indicated earlier a lot of how force major uh, events are, be, are to be dealt with have actually uh, to be determined by the contract itself uh, now the contract itself uh, you cannot read a particular force major clause uh, in a contract independent of the contract in which it is steeped now for example if we have say an it contract uh, this the, the present covid 19 may not impact an it contract as much as it would impact a toll collection contract or a construction contract okay um, now what has by and large been provided for in a lot of agreements uh, and is a suspension of a party's obligation on account of force major however generally while while there are some cert, a certain classes of contracts which allow for termination uh, a, a complete termination of obligation contractual obligations by and large what is provided for or even what the law stipulates the indian contract act and judgment stipulate is that a party may be exempted or suspended from the performance of its obligations for as long as that particular force major event continues now there are certain uh, practical issues that actually arise with regard to covid 19 uh, because at the moment there is absolutely no certainty as to how long this um, the pandemic or the lockdown is going to continue for so in that sense uh, 
th this this particular aspect while it has not yet been considered will certainly need to be looked at by the courts and in particular one needs to look at the force major clauses which are contained in the contract and see if one can interpret it in the broadest possible manner uh, now coming to recent uh, the the how the courts have recently interpreted force major contract uh, force major clauses uh, in various contracts uh, there is been uh, since march since the end of march uh, 2020 there has been a spate of litigations which has arisen uh, which a uh, spate of commercial and financial litigations especially which has arisen which has um, involved the invocation of uh, bank guarantees uh, letters of credit etc now there seem to be divergent views on this issue uh, because the delhi high court in about two or three judgments passed recently has actually qualified the current pandemic as uh, a force major event and has on that ground restrained um, the invocation and encashment of bank guarantees. The issue of suspension of leases has not yet arisen and will of course have to be, uh, will, will need to be uh, looked at as and when the case arises. But it's interesting to note uh, the divergent views because whilst the Delhi High Court has of course uh, allowed for uh, non uh, has uh, restrained the encashment and uh, uh, of bank guarantees the bombay high court has actually taken a diametrically opposite view uh, and held that the the pandemic and covid-19 being purely temporary in nature cannot qualify as a force major event what the bombay high court has also further on gone to hold is that the the um, implication of COVID-19 is purely financial and a mere financial hardship which is resulting from the COVID-19 cannot be included, cannot come within the contours of Section 56 of the Indian Contract Act. Uh, now, it is also interesting to note a recent decision of the Delhi High Court on 24th of March. And this is particularly interesting because uh, what the court has done in this particular case is the court has actually rewritten the terms of the agreement between the parties. Now, what had happened in this case is uh, a certain party was importing um, testing kits from China and it was then reselling those testing kits in India to um, particular parties at a markup of about 60, at a profit percentage of about um, 100 to 150 uh, percent. What when this matter went to court, what the Delhi High Court has actually done is uh, citing the backdrop of COVID-19, it has actually rewritten the financial terms between uh, the two parties, between the Indian uh, parties, and it has reduced the sale price from about 650 per piece to um, of uh, per, per testing kit to about rupees 400 per testing kit, and uh, the import cost was about 250 rupees per testing kit. So what the court has actually done uh, is it has sort of negated the, the, the basic principle of contracts. That is, what is the understanding between the parties? Uh, and in view of these, this particular um, situation of COVID-19, it has rewritten and redrafted the terms of the contract between the parties. Uh, so what actually emerges from uh, the discussion is that Force major number one is an extremely, extremely um, subjective uh, facet of the contract. Uh, one needs to understand, like I had said earlier, that given the current times, perhaps uh, force major clauses need to be um, interpreted in the broadest sense. Uh, there, there is a, a certain distinction also that arises in the present set of circumstances which is that all of the cases that uh, have arisen prior to these uh, decisions in 2020 have largely been the force major events have largely been restricted to that particular company or perhaps um, a particular geographic a very small geographical location uh, however what we are now witnessing is uh, an a global disruption of um, markets a, a complete breakdown of contractual obligations globally not only within india or not only restricted uh, to a particular geographical area 
So the courts need to be perceptive of this particular fact. Um, and perhaps now section 56 and a lot of force major clauses need to be a lot more liberally construed. Now, perhaps what can, uh, but however, this of course will, uh, will be a subject matter of a lot of litigation. Uh, and perhaps the, the wiser thing for the government to do will, will be to uh, come out with a policy to deal with this that will encompass uh, this issue. Um, and uh, however, at the same time, we still need to be, uh, parties still need to be extremely careful when dealing with force major clauses. As I had indicated, as of now, courts are extremely reluctant to be uh, very broad minded about invocation and suspension of uh, obligations, suspension of obligations when it comes to force major. So it would be wise to look to, to look at your force major clauses in detail, look at them very carefully. Uh, what I have noticed from uh, a lot of clients that have got back to me are um, force major clauses that have been invoked across the board, uh, irrespective of what the contract itself stipulates or irrespective of the nature of the contract which exists between the parties. Uh, to my mind, one, the parties have to be extremely careful when they are invoking their force major clause. Uh, and you need to be absolutely aware of the pitfalls that invocation of a force major clause can entail. Uh, in the long run, of course, parties have to be prepared uh, for litigation to actually thrash this matter out in court and see how, how their force major contractual clauses will be interpreted. Um, that comes to the end of my talk and um, I, I hand it back to Sonali. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mr. Angad. It was a really well described talk and we, uh, it was really insightful. Thank you so much for your time. And uh, to all the attendees, please take out the next two minutes to uh, ask any questions that you might have. And yeah, we'll introduce our next speaker in the next two minutes. All right, so I would like to introduce our next speaker. Uh, he, has, he started his practice in the year 2003 after enrollment with the Bar Council of West Bengal. He started his own law firm in the name of SKR and Associates, which is a full service law firm providing legal solutions to its clients. The firm offers a large portfolio of legal consultancy services, mainly to the corporate and banking sector. Please welcome Advocate Santosh Kumar, who will be talking uh, on the effect on the insolvency and bankruptcy code and recovering proceedings by the banks and NVFCs. Welcome, sir. Good afternoon to all the attendees. Hope my voice is audible. Uh, yes, it's clear. Thank you. So today we will discuss about the impact of coronavirus. COVID-19, which all the entire country, even world is facing the same problem. So giving effect to that, what would be the next effect to the business and all industries, banking sector, those are related with the bank, customers and all we are going to discuss. So let us understand why bankruptcy code Insolvency and Bankruptcy Code was introduced. That was an idea to bring systematic 
litigation to the national company law tribunal for quick resolution of the matter sometimes whenever we are filing cases in the court and before the tribunal and other tribunals lengthy proceeding was going on so board has decided that let us go for <coughs> insolvency and bankruptcy court and with a so more, with a great expectation it was started and there are a lot of companies so bank get some recovery might be some lenders or maybe the borrowers face some problems those were facing problems that has been crp proceeding resolution proceeding has been initiated and ultimately certain amounts of recovery made by the bank or even some corporate entity has been handed over to another company other corporate entities those are willing to buy that company during the course of crp push now we are discussing here today what would be the effect if we go really it was going well now after this situation which we are facing entire world is facing i believe that i'm discussing about our india only today so even finance minister uh, uh, finance minister has decided to give some facility to the banking sector for getting liquidity in the market and all so one by one i will discuss the details of the code let us go one by one so i have framed certain questions that why we will discussing here so in a question manner i am asking what suppose who who can file crpc proceeding crp proceeding can be filed by any individual proprietor partnership firm limited company private limited company against now they, there are certain category what is that that category is who are the financial creditor who are the operational creditor so i am just discussing a little bit idea financial creditors those the the loan which has been facilitated to the borrower for the purpose of gaining some interest and all that is coming under the purview of financial creditor and during the course of our business suppose we are supplying we are providing services and there are due those are coming under the operational day so for the purpose of recovery by the bank under section 7 bank can file an application before the national company law tribunal against the borrower and uh, borrower will respond and during that period if the the borrower is paying the dues entire dues matter would be settled or in case failure adjudicating authority that is the tribunal will appoint insolvency resolution professional irp and accordingly crp uh, proceeding will continue simultaneously the operational creditor also can sue against the against their customers that is called operational debtor for under section 9 for that reason they have to give notice under section 8 before initiating crp proceeding now after the lockdown on 25th march 2020 on 24th march 2020 a recent amendment has come into effect that amendment says earlier we have to file a case before national company law tribunal if the amount is due 1 lakh and more minimum 1 lakh rupees was the criteria after that after this 24th march 
this limit has been increased to rupees 1 crore minimum so this this will give some relief to the in, to the industrialist because they are facing some financial crunches suppose there is a 60 lakh 70 lakh 90 lakh 99 lakh they will get some relief it is not all the debts are more than 1 crore and all so now this relief can really be appreciated so that section 4 has been amended even on 13th march 2020 the code has also been amended to the effect that earlier the real estate allotee home buyers was not under the purview of this code now after 13th march 2020 they have also come under the purview of ibc code as a financial creditor with certain stipulation what was the stipulation the stipulation was that uh, suppose in a real estate project at least 100 numbers of members allotees jointly file CIRP proceeding or at least 10 percent of the allotee jointly file a case so on 13th march 2020 this amendment has come into effect so home buyer has also right to initiate CIRP proceeding and this is a quick and immediate method immediately suppose after hearing the parties if nclt the adjudicating authority finding themselves that this is a fit case to admit and they are admitting it and thereafter uh, interim resolution professional resolution professional are taking care of the entire thing and that way everybody is getting quick justice before nclt now i am also discussing a little bit on november 15th november 2019 there were also a notification that personal guarantee to the corporate debtor are also coming under the purview of ibc code suppose a loan has been taken by abcd company and uh, during that period i have also signed as a maybe as a personal guarantor so i am also liable to repay the loan jointly and severally and appropriate application can be filed against me as well so these are the impact changes now after this situation covid 19 2019 government is also deciding to suspend section 7 9 and 10 maybe i don't know but it might be in a pipeline so government might suspend for a limited period section 7 9 and 10 that way at least industrialist or the business community may get help of it now simultaneously if we are discussing about the banking sector how banking sector will suffer or banking se sector realize their deals after this amendment uh, you all are witness that on 25th march 2020 due to nationwide lockdown entire business and industry become standstill. However, RBI announced a development and regulatory policy. Under that policy, RBI tried to expanding liquidity in the system. That will help. That liquidity will definitely help us in the long term. Not only that, 
I can also say by that circular 27th and 25th March 2020, which RBI has issued that circular. As per that circular, even reinforcing the monetary transmission so that bank credit flows on easier terms and sustained to the effective due to COVID. And easing financial stress caused by COVID 2019. So we will think in the broader perspective that tomorrow liquidity will not be a problem as far as we are gathering so many articles, so many news, so many, even I have attended webinar in related to infrastructure and construction. It was hosted by PhD Chamber of Commerce. I have participated there. So liquidity would not be a problem. Only problem is if we pass this critical phase, definitely we will be successful and everywhere government is also protecting us in so many ways. It is not that government are, is not protecting. Even suppose earlier, prior to this COVID 2019 situation, what was the situation before the debt recovery tribunal? If there is a dues, more than 90 days, it becomes NPA. After that, surface proceeding would be initiated. 13-2 notice is going to be given. After that, 13-4, thereafter, 13-4, uh, thereafter, they are going for taking position. In case borrower are giving obstruction, they are approaching to the district magistrate or district judge or chief metropolitan magistrate court for getting appropriate police permission and assistance. Now, at least three months relief has been granted. It is not, your account would not be NPA. It would not be declared NPA. It would be declared a special mention account at, as a SMA. So definitely after three months, again, we renew our business, everything, and uh, hope everything would be fine. So this way, government is also protecting us. It is not that we are not getting any relief. So there is a relief. After that period, so my learned, another friend has also spoke about uh, force major clause and all. All will come into effect. But so far as business point of view, I am discussing today. So there are relief. NPA you have been protected by SMA. So three months is this this is the three months period again three months for NPA. So six months altogether we are getting six months time to to allowing bank to file a case against you. Now so far as the other cases are concerned which has already been filed prior to that there are certain circulars in the pipeline, restructuring of the loan. You can approach for one-time settlement that is already there, OTS proposal. So, so many way out is there and government finance department, RBI and bank, banking sector are trying to protect the industrialists in so many ways. Even moratorium of term loan has been extended. So this way, we will say that we are lucky that uh, in debt recovery tribunal or NCLT, immediately cases would not be filed even if we are facing any difficulty in paying the debts. Now, because this is the effect, so I am not going to discuss about details of the law and all. So I'm just shortly I'm explaining that impact. Impact is very fine. Being a businessman, I say I must thank um, give thank you to my government that they are protecting me three months and three months altogether, six months already I'm getting time. Even banks have been 
informed by the RBI by its circular that they will think about how to settle the dues, restructure package, or there are certain requirement to the lender, they will provide. If the borrower, uh, sorry, if the borrower is seeking any further enhance of the overdraft facility, definitely they will consider. There, there are certain rules and regulations, there are some parameters, and definitely that would be considered. So we can say that, yes, we are protected. It is not that uh, COVID 2019 will take away our entire hope. So again, we will come back in a good situation, win-win situation. Even I am seeing sometimes our equity share market are increasing. It is also witness that yes, we will today or tomorrow, we will definitely succeed. Yes, Even uh, two, three days back, I have heard that uh, I have also gone through some notification that uh, government has also allowed to use card that like a debit and a debit card in overdubbed facility, overdubbed account. So that is also a good gesture by RBI. So that is on 23rd April. Yes, let me correct. On 23rd April 2020, electronic card for overdubbed account has been introduced. But that is limited to the domestic transaction. So this way we can say that we are protected. Now let us discuss about the pending cases. So far as pending cases are concerned, court might give some opportunity. We are expecting. I am not saying that maybe or may not be, but court might give some chances to the operational, uh, to the corporate data to resolve their disputes with the bank, NBFC, non-banking financial institution, and other cooperative banks and all, to develop their business. Even they will provide some relief to the business entity. So this way we will say that we are very much protected in every corner. Now, let us discuss some one or two more questions here. So I don't know, until unless uh, they have no question answer session, so which area I have to speak, I don't know. But uh, in a question answer session, if somebody has any questions, they definitely put on or ask, I can answer. So this is a vast subject, both banking, surfacey, and all. So I don't think much more I can offer at this stage. So I'll request uh, Ms. Sonali that uh, if any other speaker are there, you can ask them to speak a little bit to our audience and say. Thank you so much, sir. Hi, Thank Ms. You for your Sonali. Yeah. Thank you so much, Hello. sir, for your wonderful session. Can you hear me? Uh, sir, can you hear me? Yes, yes, I'm getting it. Yes. So I, I believe that uh, overall, little, because you know the changes, until unless there are certain changes, I can't go more deeply into the matter. So in a question answer session, I'll be able to speak more. Right. So anything more you can highlight, I can answer. No. Thank you so much, sir. All the attendees out there, please type in any questions that you might have in the Q&A section and we'll take all of those questions at uh, our inner Q&A round. Yeah, Thank you so much. Fine. That would be yeah. fine. Because I don't understand which, which area I have to address. So a little bit, I have just given an idea which are the changes coming into. Okay, I'm over to giving Sonali. Yes, sir. Thank you so much. Yes. Welcome, ma'am.
so uh, we'll introduce our next speaker in two minutes time please type in any questions that you might have Right, so I would now like to introduce our next speaker. He holds experience in the field of labor, industrial and employment laws, civil and commercial laws, and has an in-depth knowledge on subjects like arbitration, energy, environmental laws, EIA, forest laws, intellectual property rights, international cyber laws, information technology laws, medical laws, money laundering, and others. Please welcome Advocate Pulkit Prakash, founding partner at Neeti Bodh and advocate at the Supreme Court of India. He will be talking about the tax and finance regime in the, in the era of COVID-19. Welcome Mr. Pulkit. Uh, Mr. Pulkit, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you now. Mm, yeah. Thank you. Hello, everyone. So, should I or should I not? Yeah, of course. Just please start. Okay. Okay. Fine. Hello, everyone. And I'll be just very brief about the topic and will not drag you to the here and there and everything else. I'll, I'll just immediately share the screen which I have with myself and then you can read it out all, along with myself. Okay. So these are the list of uh, some of the. I'll go down, 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 down. So my topic is uh, tax law and the finance law, and I'll be briefing you out with the, all the laws and notification which has been passed out in the recent time period in respect to the COVID-19. So I'll start with the finance law, and thereafter we can come up to the tax law, right? So the first notification which came into that effect in respect to the COVID-19 was on 4th March. That was in relation to the finance law, in relation to the businesses. And it was says that, that the guidelines to be followed by the insurers for handling of insurance claim reported to coronavirus. So this was in relation to the industry which is related to insurance sector. And it was been informed to them that how you are supposed to take care of the subject matters wherein people who has been suffering from coronavirus and they have come up with the claim that I've been get, getting treatment done from so-and-so hospital in respect to my illness. Thereafter, on 16th March, they again came up with another a notification wherein it was like the operational and the business continuity of the measures to be taken by the banks and the other financial institutions such as taking stocks of critical processes and encouraging the customers to take up the digital banking facilities. So this was done to ensure that less number of people approach the bank and the branches to get their work done so that more and more people sit at the back at their home and do the job which is essential for them rather than coming every now and then to the bank only and then wasting time and then spreading the coronavirus. So these were these two notifications, three notifications, some of the notifications were prior to 24th March 2020 before the lockdown was announced. Then this was on March 20 which says that SEBI relaxes the compliance of certain obligation and disclosure requirements in view to COVID pand pandemic, such as filing of corporate governance report, compliance certificate on share transfer facility. 
Thereafter, on 24th March, they came up with another notification saying that the SEBI notified from the SEBI itself. So SEBI notified the capital and the debt market services to be exempted from the nationwide lockdown. These include the registered stock exchanges, clearing the corporation and mutual funds, and among others. On 27th March, they came up with the notification of relaxation from the substantial acquisition of sales and takeovers regulations. These regulations require the shareholders to compile, collate, disseminate information of other of their consolidated shareholding as on March 31st, 2020, to the company and stock exchanges. So this was also relaxed by 27th March. On the same day, another by another notification, instructions were given to the bank and NBFC by the Reserve Bank of India on measures for easing the burden of debt servicing, three-month moratorium on payment, installment, etc. Then on same day, RBI released a statement on development and regulatory policies to address the stress in the financial conditions caused by COVID-19. This includes the expanding, expanding liquidity in the system and relaxing the repayment pressure also. Same day, again, another notification from the RBI, which reduced the repo rate from 5.15% to 4.4 and the reverse repo rate from 4.9% to 4% in March 2020 due to the negative effect of the coronavirus. On 28th March, they relaxed, the relaxation came for the insurers to submit a board approved final reassurance program till May 31st, 2020. So they were supposed to do it by 31st March, 2020 only. So now they are supposed to do, do it by 31st May, 2020. On 30th March, they came up with the steps to be taken by insurers, again, for the insurance company only amidst the COVID-19 pandemic for the smooth functioning of insurance industry. These include displaying COVID-19 claims related to frequently asked questions on their website, putting in place, putting in place a certain business continuity plan. Please wait a second, please wait. Sorry, sorry. Uh, so on 31st, 38th March, they again came with the relaxation in compliance to requirements of uh, foreign personal index. This is this is in relation to the investment which has been done by foreign personalities into the invest into the industries in India, and any shareholding or buyback shareholding or the or the angel investment or something like that was relaxed, and any compliances which was supposed to be done to the Ministry of Corporate Affairs were also relaxed. On 1st April 2020, the RBI decides that it is not necessary to implement the counter clinical capital buffer for a period of one year. So this is this is a framework which aims the banking system to build up a buffer of capital in good times, which may be used to maintain flow of credit in real sector in different time, in difficult times. So what RBI wanted to do with this particular notification was to release as much fund which they have with themselves to the society and to the business in general so that every business in general get benefited out of it and no business in general face the cash uh, cash flow or credit flow credit line difficulty on first may it's first april itself they again came with the press release clarification stating that the indemnity based health insurance products that cover the treatment cost of hospitalization should cover the cost of hospitalization treatment also. On 4th April, they came up with the life insurance policies whose premiums fall due in March and April, an additional grace of 30 days was applied. So whosoever premium was falling in March or, or was getting completed in March and they were supposed to pay the premium for the next subsequent period of time was again given the 30 period time to those who, whose premium was getting over on March, they were given a time period till April. Those whose premium was getting closed in April, they were given a time period in May. On April 8, the IIDI permits the insurance to grant a moratorium for three months towards the payment of installment, failing between 1st March 2020 to 31st May 2020. So what happened over here that any person who has taken any sort of loan with themselves they were allowed to have a moratorium of three months with themselves to pay the installments in respect to that particular aspect. Then on 13th April, they came up with the related released guidelines for the prudent management of financial resources 
of insurance in context of COVID-19 pandemic. This includes the critically examining the, the capital availability and solvency margin and required and devise the strategies to ensure that they have adequate capital. So this was in relation to the insurance company again, so that the insurance company keep on working with themselves and they keep on be, be available to everyone whosoever is coming up with the force measure clause and saying that I want to refund for that particular aspect or I want to refund for that particular aspect of the losses which I have faced in my business due to this lockdown and some support. So this was necessary for the insurance sector because if they don't have the money with themselves, any company or any business who has failed in their business or who has not been able to continue their business in this pandemic time period and have suffered great amount of losses and have forced measure clause with themselves and the indemnity clause with themselves to seek benefit out of those indemnity and forced measure clause, claiming their losses before the insurance claim, insurance company so that they get money with themselves that they keep on doing with the business, right? On 16th April, the CV provides the relaxation in certain regulatory requirements such as the client funding reporting and risk-based supervision reporting for stock exchange and clearing corporations. On 16th April itself, the CV provides a relaxation in time period for certain activities carried out by depository participants such as processing of DMAT request. On 17th April, they came up with, in view of the COVID-19, the period of March 1st, 2020 to May 31st, 2020, be excluded from 30-day review period post which the leaders, lenders are required to implement the 180-day resolution plan for the resolution of stressed assets. So this was in relation to the NPA, which uh, Sir was saying, Mr. Santos Sir was, Sir, Sir was saying about. So all the premiums which we are supposed to, the EMIs which we have taken with ourselves or for house loan or for whatsoever loan has been deferred for a a strong period of time and you have six months of period of time with yourself to come back with your EMI plans and then to repay. Then the RBI revised the liquidity coverage ratio in form of high quality liquid assets to be maintained with the banks. Banks will be required to maintain 80% of the liquidity LCR till September 20, 90% from October 20 to March 21st and 100% from April 1st, 2021 onwards. So this was also in, to ensure that the bank have the money with themselves to support the businesses which are facing losses because of the lockdown. And if they come up with the, with the policy saying, uh, with the applicant saying, we need money to keep on business, keep on running. The banks may have money with themselves and say that, okay, I have money with myself. Take it and cover up your losses, come out of your losses and again, start doing your business. On the same day, RBI mandated that the bank should not make any further dividend payouts from the profits of the profit of financial year 2020 till further instructions. This was done to ensure that the bank conserves the capital to retain their capacity to support the economy and absorb losses in view of COVID-19. So what happened is that any company, uh, any bank also runs like a company and they have shareholders in that company. So whosoever is a shareholder, if the bank is in profit and makes profit, the, every shareholder gets some money with themselves. So this was a stop with this notification that whosoever is the shareholder of whatsoever bank will not be getting money from the profit earned by the in the financial year 2020 to ensure that the money is there with the bank only so that if someone is coming to cover up the losses or to take money with, with themselves to keep going on, they may have that money from the bank. The same day, uh, the RBI announces the several additional measures to combat the macroeconomic condition due to COVID-19. These include the reduction of, again, the repo rate was reduced from 4% to 3.75%. Refinancing of financial institutions like NABARD, ZB, NHB, for a total of 50,000 crore rupees. So RBI gave 50,000 crore rupees to these institutions so that the small MSME institutions, small and medium enterprises institutions, the proprietors and whosoever are like startups who, who have taken loans from these institutions or who are willing to take loans from these institutions to keep on going in the businesses, may approach these institutions and may take money and then keep on going and keep on covering the losses with themselves which they have suffered due to this lockdown. On 18th April, the IIDI, uh, again the insurance sector, specifies the certain norms for the settlement of the health insurance. Uh, Claims reported to COVID-19, the norms are specified that the insurance will decide the health insurance claims expeditiously. 
So this was this was done to ensure that whosoever is coming up with with the claim like I have been suffering from the coronavirus and I've been getting treatment from so and so institution or so and so hospital, and a cost of rupees is not has has been billed to me. I want those to be refunded because I have a health policy at myself. So apart from the other health policy, this to be get priority so that people may get treated at at an immediate effect and. It doesn't mean that the other other health insurance policies were like like neglected at all, but then this was given priority by this notification that yes, you should take care of these insurance claims more than that of any other of the cancer or AIDS or whatsoever like that. On 21st April, the SEBI again granted certain relaxations to improve the access of funding of corporates to capital market in view of COVID-19 outbreak. This includes the reduced eligibility threshold of average market capitalization from 250 crore rupees to 100 crore. So the reduction was been ensured that any person who is coming up with the capital market uh, regulations or capital market policy that you wanted to have the capitalization of the institution or capitalization of the sale or the business or something like that. So that was reduced from 250 crore to 100 crore so that more and more people can get facilitated out of that. In normal circumstances, it's 100, 250 crore. In, in these circumstances, it was reduced from 250 crore to 100 crore. On 21st, 21st April, again, the IIDA permits the insurance to collect the health insurance premiums in the installment and in view of prevailing the conditions going to COVID-19 outbreak. So, the insurance which you have taken as a health insurance policy with yourself and if you have a premium to be paid like say let's say around 5000 rupees per month or 10000 rupees per month you can split, split it down into 3000 rupees 4000 rupees as an emi and then you can pay it to the bank to the the concerned insurance sector and no one will ask you to say that no you are supposed to you are also supposed to pay premium to that insurance sector. On 23rd April, the CB relaxes the buyback period restrictions for the companies in view of the COVID-19 to enable the quicker access in capital. Currently, the regulations restrict the companies to raise capital for a period of one year from the expiry of buyback period. This has been reduced to six months. So there was an eight, again a relaxation in terms of the business so that, that business may keep on going, the economy may keep on going, and everybody come out of this situation, which is which is all of a sudden has been enforced by this has been imposed upon us like anything <laughs> on 23rd april the cb relaxes the regulation requiring the entities to hold azm currently the regulation requires top 100 companies by the market capitalization to hold an agm within five months from closing of finance so this was also relaxed in situation of these situations in these sort of situations on 24th april the irdi urges the insurers to refrain from dividend payout from profits pertaining to the financial year 2020 till further constructions to conserve the capital in view of emerging market. So again, the things which was happened, the instructions which was given to the bank that do not pay any money in any profit amount to the shareholders of your company, of, your, of yourself, which is a bank. The same instructions was also given to the insurance company that you're not supposed to pay the dividend and the profit which you have earned in the past financial year to the to your shareholders so that the money remains with the insurance companies so that they can uh, they can clear the claim of life insurance or the force majority clauses or indemnity clauses or the health insurance clauses and so on so forth. Things which has been. On 27th April, the CB reduces the brokerage turnover fees and filing fees on offer documents for the public issue, right issue, buyback of sales. Both the broker and turnover fees filing fees has been reduced to by 50% for document filed between June 2020 to December 2020. The benefits reduced will be passed on to investors as well. So, so this was in respect to the all investment scheme which you have with those. Uh, invested in the mutual fund scheme. And if you wanted to that, get that mutual fund scheme uh, be culled out and to have that money with yourself, to ensure that mutual fund companies have money with themselves, that if the brokerage fee was reduced to 50%. Let's say, presume that if you buy a mutual fund of, let's presume, 100 rupees, and over that 100 rupees, 2 rupees was supposed to be given to a, to a broker, to a broker who has sold you that policy, now he'll be getting 1 rupees to ensure that the money and if you wanted to claim that money with your from those companies they may give it to you 
So the last one is so RBI announced a special liquidity facility for mutual funds of total fifty thousand crore rupees. So uh, last time they informed me they made a notification in respect to SETB. Now they have made a notification in respect to mutual fund for fifty thousand crore rupees. Funds available availed under the facility can be used by banks exclusively for meeting the liquidity requirements of mutual funds by extending loans, purchase of repos against collateral held by mutual funds, and so on. So this is all about the financial laws. We by the Ministry of Finance in respect to the finance laws and the financial situation which is going on in this country. And as far as the tax law is concerned, so on 24th March, 24th March, the, uh, there was a notification for the citizens, which was the deadline of filing tax returns and other dues compliances were extended, interest rate and additional charges were lowered, relaxed for delayed payments. So that was first notification in respect to this COVID-19. Then the second notification on the same day came for the businesses that the relief measures were announced by the finance minister regarding income tax filing, GST filing, and the corporate affairs. On 31st March, ordinances were issued to extend the time limit for the various tax compliances. 100% reductions were given to the to given to those who were donating to the PM Care Fund under ATG. And then on 31st March itself, the person for the, this was for the citizens again, the persons whose application for the lower tax collection deductions at the source under certain certain sections are not approved can be you can use previous certificates. So, like for example, if you have been if you have built someone and uh, the tax deductible at source, the certificate relates in relation to that TDS was not issued to you. And if you have previous TDS with yourself saying that I have this uh, you my TDS certificate till this period of time, I have not got for this period of time, you please look into this. And I'm complying with the laws of the tax taxation system in India. That is absolutely okay as per this notification. On third March, on sorry, on third April, the notification under the ordinance of ordinance were passed to extend the time limits for various GST compliances to June 30 from uh, March 20. Similarly, this was for the citizens. Uh, notification allows persons whose applications for the lower tax deductions at source were not approved, and then previous certificate to use, similar to that of the last notification that you can use till June, no issues at all. Then again, the taxation, in taxation on 8 April, citizens, this notification was again for citizens, all pending income tax, GST, and the custom refund to be issued immediately, worth around 18,000 crores, estimated to reach around 50 tax. 15 lakhs taxpayer. So all the money which was which was there with the income tax department and in terms of calculating the tax ratio as how much money is to be refunded and how much money is to be kept with the tax department as a tax uh, payment done by the several citizens or the organizations and so forth. So allocating those and calculating those, the 18,000 crore rupees was, was released by the government of India from the calculation of income tax and GST so that it can reach to as many people as it can. And it was estimated that 15 lakh people will get benefited out of this. On 9th, on 9th April, the exemptions were granted from the basic custom duty and the health test till September 2020 on import of ventilators, masks, PPE, test kits, and inputs used to manufacture these. So this was done in respect of, uh, to ensure that the R&D keeps on going in respect to uh, in respect to COVID-19. On 23rd April, uh, DGS, so this is Directorate for the General Shipping. DGS stands for Directorate for the General Shipping, has extended the due dates for filing the tonnage tax returns for the year 2020. So whosoever is in, involved into the import-export business, so his compliances has also been extended so that he can, he can take care of his losses and the difficulty which he is facing in the business. So on 24th April, uh, new reporting requirements related to tax audit report for the businesses affecting from 1st of April 2020 to be kept in abeyance till 31st March 2021. So this was the last notification which was passed by the government of India uh, and from the uh, Ministry, uh, Department of the Tax, Income Tax and uh, Indirect Tax, GST, stating that anyone who has who has been into the business and has to give the tax audit report. Uh, so on 1st April, 
or uh, effective on first april 2020 will be will be will not will not be touched till 31st march 2021 so these are the some notifications which has been passed by the government of india in respect to the covid 19 in respect to taxes and laws or in respect to the financial situation and stability in the country and all these uh, notifications can be can be looked on either you can go on the website of indiacode.com or you can go on the direct websites of the ministry of tax and uh, sorry department of tax and the ministry of finance you'll find these notifications over there you can also assess the website of rbi you can find a notification over there as well and if you if you do not have the uh, what will say uh, very very um, clean hand in serving those website then you can look to the website of uh, prs and uh, other bill others websites wherein these bills have been uh, maintained date and event on by date department category etc you can go and look into them then there are some i'll i'll read some uh, basic direct government papers with for you uh, i wanted to show it to you so these are some of the some of the papers which has been issued by the ministry of uh, finance well, in respect to the frequently asked questions allowed for the banks to declare the moratorium on the terms of the loans this is easily available on the website of ministry of finance and it has been issued by the press information bureau you can go and you can get it done and you can download it from there itself so there are a few questions which is related to these aspects like what was the rbi announcement why rbi announced why has the rbi announced the relief package and then which are the four facilities eligible for availing the benefits under rbi covid 19 regulatory package and whether the facility is extended across the board to all borrowers or not so it said that yes everyone has been covered everyone every person has been covered be it from loans from retail crop loans loans from under pool purchases whosoever is there everyone is covered in this benefit then there was a question of is rescheduling of the payment applicable to all term of loans it was said yes yes it is applicable to everyone everyone and no one has been like be left alone left is rescheduling the term of the loans only for the principal account or it's also include the interest and then it was said that rescheduling of the principal can be done for a period of three months filling due between march 1st to 2020 to may 31st 2020 for example if your last installment of a term loan falls due for the payment for payment of on say first march 2020 it will be now as first june 2020 the next question was the what happens if the extended tenor of the term loan is beyond the maximum period is stipulated for a period for a product or stipulate for the loan policy so that can be extended also what will be the treatment of interest on the working capital facilities the recovery of the interest facility interest applied for the cash credit overdraft on 31st march 31st 38th april 31st may is being deferred so this was also deferred so if there is any interest which is which is of, about which you are like uh, very afraid that interest will be accrued at at the end of the day so that was also deferred like no issues on that point also what will be the impact of this relief by rbi on borrowers as far as the reporting of default is concerned so this was clarified that up to 5 crore uh, the credit bureau if if you have taken loan up to 5 crore for your business or for anything any person any other purposes with yourself so your credit is not going your, your credit rating system is not going to be affected so government is not going to give the give the data of these three months to the credit credit rating system of who ensures that who should get the loan and who should not get the loan based on the previous payment structure and so on so forth so that means that individuals should take necessarily the benefit and so on so forth should i get upset if the bank has get approach these are basic questions that what about what about my credit card use so this was also been exempted in terms of the credit card use if you wanted to get it exempted for the next three months you can get it exempted for the next three months what about the interchangeability being permitted from non-fund based to fund based or fund based to non-fund based so that was also interchangeably made available in other ways the businesses has been given relief so yes the businesses were at the request of the bank to reassess the working capital requirements on account of disruption of the cash flows or elongation of working capital cycle this may also request the reduction in margin on nfb lc lc stands for letter of credit bc bg stands for bank guarantee 
or also relief and security. So decisions will be taken by the bank branches in case to case basis and on the genuineness of the request, of course. Are NBFC, MFI, HSC eligible under easing of working capital facilities? So yes, that was also been allowed. Will all these measures of RBI be treated as restructuring? The measures of stipulated by the RBI under March 27, 2020 circular on COVID-19 regulatory package will not be treated as restructuring. So this was made clear. So your loans and your credit facilities were not restructured. It was just extended for three months period of time. So there was no restructuring in altogether of these facilities. So what about the instruments of EMI being recovered through SI, ECS, NACH, and so on? So that was also revised. Similarly, uh, Ministry also find, uh, made a, this was also a notification made available by the Ministry of Finance. You can go and check it out on the Ministry of Finance website. You can, that is easily available over there. So in view of the situation, uh, the Union Ministry and the Corporate Affairs made several announcements. And those were, first was in respect to income tax. So the last date for the income tax returns were from 31st March to 30th June. Linking of Aadhaar PAN card from 31st March to 30th June. Vivaad Siviswasa scheme, no additional 10% amount if be made to by 30th June. And entire working in relate to, relation to Vivaad Siviswasa scheme was also extended till 30th June. Similarly, the GST indirect tax. When it comes to GST indirect tax, then the aggregate Last, last, like I said, that the crore was extended with no interest, no late fee, no penalty, no nothing. Similarly, for the month, but, but if you cross by June 20, then 9% will be applicable upon you. The penalty will be of 9% instead of 18%. That also was reduced by half, despite being knowing that even if you cross the period of June 2020. So the interest, if you're supposed to pay, that has to be reduced from 18 to 9. Similarly, the date of opting the composition of the scheme was also extended. Filing was also extended to June. Everything was extended till June. Sapka Viswas scheme was also extended to June. So custom was made available, custom clearance was made available till 30th June 24-7. No issues, due date of issuing notice and everything was also every compliances were also extended till 30th June. And the financial services were relaxed till three months. The debit card holder withdrew cash from free. Any ATM, any bank, any any bank ATM, anywhere, any number of times you can withdraw it, no charges will be applicable upon you. You are not supposed to maintain the minimum balance which is mandated as per the uh, as per the saving account you, which you have there with yourself. Like for example, if you have a bank account in Yes Bank and if your Yes Bank says that you have to maintain 5,000 rupees minimum balance in your bank account or let's say 10,000 rupees on minimum balance in bank account. So that has been also waived for the time being. This is transactions has been made free altogether the corporate affairs in terms of corporate affairs no additional fees will be charged for the late filing from 1st april to 30th september so this was done to till 30th september in respect to any any applications return statement document any sort of mandatory requirement of holding the meetings were also exempted applicability of companies auditors were also exempted notified significantly so as per clause four of the Companies Act, independent directors are required to hold one last meeting, at least one meeting without the attendance of non-independent directors and the members of management will not be able to hold even one meeting. That was also been exempted at. Okay, so, so these are entirely all those activities which has been exempted. You can go and you can read on the website. I have shared it for yourself only and I'm sharing it directly from the government government notification to nobody gets to go to okay. So someone has said in some seminar and then that is not matching with what government of India has said. So that is why I, instead of making a presentation and so on and so forth. So what uh, Sir was saying just before me that like, the IBC was has been extended to one crore. Initially, if you have a due of one lakh rupees with yourself, someone may come up against you seeking your winding up. In, in the NCLT National Committee Law Tribunal as per the IBC Code 2016. So that one lakh has been extended to one crore. So unless and until you have a due of one crore, nobody is coming up against you seeking that, no, go out of the business. Enough is enough. So that is not going to happen to you. Similarly, Department of these, these if someone is, is into the fishery industry, he may come up with this also, the all sanitary permits and 
were also extended till three months and one month liable was also condoned rebooking was also condoned verification documents were relaxed to seven days to three days department of commerce has extended the compliance procedures so these are the things which has been done by the government of india in respect to the tax and finance law so the uh, please so there is a notification also in respect to these on 21st uh, 27th march 2020 in, in for the entire small bank finance local area banks regional banks cooperative banks state cooperative banks district central cooperative banks saying that what you're supposed to do what regulatory package was supposed to do and in, the, in terms of regulatory package you have been they have been marked that the statement of development and regulatory process on the reserve bank of india so this is also the actual notification you can go and seek on the website of state reserve bank of india and you can read it on your own so they have given nine nine headers into this one is of the liquidity management is how you're supposed to do the liquidity management second is the targeted loan term report operation then comes with the uh, cash reserve ratio so how you're supposed to maintain the cash reserve ratio then the marginal standing facility then the widening of the monetary policy rate corridor then this is mon moratorium on the term loans which was extended by three months. This is detriment of the interest on the working capital facilities. Then this is easing of working capital financing. Then the deferment on the implementation of net stable funding ratio. And then the deferment of the last tranche of the capital contribution buffer. So everything was covered by the bank. Everything was covered by the Reserve Bank of India, considering the situation which we are going through. And with, with more and money, more and more money has been flushed into the market so that the businesses keep on going. Nobody faces any sort of difficulty. Then in terms of the financial markets, also the permitting bank to deal with the offsource and non-deliverable rupees derivative market. So money which was supposed to come from the international market, if someone has dealt into that particular aspect, that was also been covered while making this notification. So this was all. And then the status report has been filed in the matter of uh, I'll, I'll so the this is the status report which has been filed in the supreme court of india by the central bank by the central government in the matter of alok 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 srivastav versus union of india and wherein they have come up with all what have they done in terms of uh, uh, interstate migration and so on and so forth and what have they done in terms of facilitating the research and development in terms of covid 19 what have they done in terms of minimum staff and social distancing and so on and so forth what is more important while while reading this reply from the government of india when you will come at page uh, 36 yes page 36 so when you will come at the pm cares funds so they have said that they're keeping in mind the need of having an dedicated national fund with a primary objective of dealing with any kind of emergency or distress situation like possessed like posed by COVID-19 pandemic and to provide relief to the affected a public charitable trust under the name of PM Citizen Assistance or PM Relief Emergency Situation Fund has been set up. PM is the chairman of this trust and it's include Defense Minister, Home Minister and the Finance Minister. Thereafter, they also explained the situations which they can, which they wanted to cover. And they said that the central government announced 1.7 lakh crore relief package under Pradhan Mantri Garib Kalyan Yosna for, for the poor people to help them fight the battle against coronavirus. And then they explained the silent features that the insurance cover of rupees 50 lakh per health worker fighting against fighting COVID-19 will be provided. This was for the doctors, 80 crore rupees poor people, 80 crore poor people will be provided 5 kg wheat or rice and 1 kg preferred pulses free of cost every month for the next three months. 20 crore women Jandan account holders will be given a cash assistance of rupees 500 per month per person. Although this is a less amount, but then something is better than nothing. Eight crore, eight crore poor families registered under the scheme of Ujwala will get one gas cylinder per family per month, free of course for the next three months. Manarega wage to be increased to rupees 200 to a day from 182. Uh, which will benefit 13.62 crore families. Ex aggressive financial assistance of rupees 1000 per person will be given to three crore poor citizens, poor widows, poor disabled. Government will front load rupees 2000 to farmers in first week of April under the existence PMK Sand used now to benefit 8.7 crore farmers, wage earners, 
earning below 15,000 per month in the businesses having less than 100 workers would be given 24% of their monthly wages into their PF account per person per month for the next three months. Central government has given orders to state government to use building and construction workers welfare fund to provide relief to construction workers and support 3.5 crore registered workers. NDMA has been given interacting uh, with the state governments through the field visits meeting and the video conferences since first, few, first week of February on various aspects of containment in uh, COVID-19. So this is all which has the government of India has done in terms of the tax and finance and to ensure that the economy is still running and we are in good hands and everybody comes out of this situation. Apart from this, uh, there is one more case which has been come up in Supreme Court of India last week itself, wherein someone has come up with a policy, with a, with an idea that the, whatever money which has been given in the PMKF fund, that should be utilized exclusively for the migrant workers, exclusively for those workers who have been stranded in their real estate issues or in the real estate business or in the travel industry or whatsoever industry where and they are, and their money should be the money which is supposed to be paid to them from the side of the employer shall be paid to them from the fund which has been created in the pm relief uh, care fund so it is estimated that what if the government agrees to do that 75 percent of the fund which has been which is there in the pm care relief will go for that so all the employers um, who are responsible to pay to their employees will for the next three months and the payment will be done by undertaken by the government of india and those payment is coming from the pm care fund provided uh, the applicant win that case and the supreme court of india approves it and then union of india makes no objection and so forth so this would be all sonali uh, from my side i think i'm done and now you may take care i'm um, take take control right Thank you so much, Mr. Pulgit, for such a detailed and informative session. Thank you so much. Uh, mm -hmm. We'll get to the Q and A section now. Uh, session now. So, most of the questions have already been answered by our wonderful speakers. So, uh, if you still have any questions that you would like uh, to raise, please type in that question in the Q and A section. And uh, I would like Mr. Sahil to lead this round for us. So, Mr. Sahil, over to you, if you can just uh, lead us through the Q&A round. Thank you so much, Sonali. And thank you so much to all the speakers and to all the audience who have patiently uh, listening to everyone. And I hope the session was really insightful. So, I have first question specifically for Advocate Neeraj Dubey. Uh, sir, can you hear me? Yes. Ah, all right, sir. So, so the question is, if an employee tenders resignation during the COVID-19 lockdown, can his or her relieving be delayed till the lockdown gets over, considering he or she is holding company's assets and critical information as well as in his or her possession? Yeah, so uh, if even if the company is waiving the notice period, on the request of the employee uh, or requesting the employee to complete the notice period which would com be completed within the uh, the lockdown period or immediately after uh, in order to secure the confidential uh, information and property of the company the company can ask the employee not to leave the employment till such time and if the company can take such a certain approval to procure the data physically if it needs to then i don't see a possible i don't see any problem uh, wherein uh, that permission will not be granted there are uh, forms prescribed to approach the local police to seek that approval and uh, on uh, the request the police can grant you approval one of the employees can go and collect the person, uh, company data and information all right all right sir thank you so much sir so the next question is specifically for advocate angad mehta sir can you hear me hello yeah hello sir yeah 
So, so the question is, if the contract with the vendors didn't have force majeure clause, can we still invoke it and get benefits with regards to delay in the payment to be made to them? Sorry, could you just repeat the question? Sure, sir. So the question is, if the contract with the vendors didn't have yeah. force majeure clause, yeah. can we still invoke it and get benefits with regard to delay in the payments to be made to them? Uh, unless, well, to, uh, that question can be answered in two parts. Uh, the first part is, of course, you can uh, invoke it. You can invoke Section 56 of the uh, Indian Contract Act, citing uh, difficulty and impossibility of performance. Uh, as far as the second part is concerned, uh, is seeking uh, shelter. Um, unless the contracts are back to back, as of now, courts are reluctant to grant uh, shelter under force major. Uh, but as I had indicated earlier, I'm um, hopeful that given the current scenario and the scale of uh, the pandemic that we are faced for, that you will be given some sort of uh, shelter. All right, sir. Thank you so much, sir. So the next question is specifically for Advocate Prerna Oberai. Ma'am, can you hear me? Hello, Advocate Prerna, can you hear me? Yes, yes, yes. Please tell me. Yeah. Yeah. So the question is, do you think business struggling to stay afloat with unemployment spiking rate 23% and growth poised to shrink about 5% in the current situation will get the benefit from the anti-lockdown loans? See, I believe these are the initiatives that are being taken by banks and BFCs and you know various other financial institutions to let the businesses be afloat. I know it's going to be a hard time for businesses with with the kind of and this is the only way the loans are being given at lower percent within uh, you know with, with the very least formalities is certainly the only way to get out of the whole struggle. Right, ma'am. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, so there is one more question for you. Is it necessary to be registered under Startup India to avail CSAS? Absolutely. It is mandatory to be registered under Startup India. You know, you need to get the DPIIT registration into well, all these schemes that are being offered by SIDBI in particular. All right, ma'am. So I have another question for Advocate Pulkit Prakash. So can you hear me, sir? Yes, I can hear you. All right. So the question is, what's the position on interest on interest being charged by banks on loans during these three months? So the interest is there. You have to pay the interest. Interest, not on interest, but interest is there. So interest will be accumulated. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, but so then there is, is one more case, which, uh, so there is a case yeah. also to, uh, in respect to that, and that is pending in the Delhi High Court. That is in between the one of the borrower of from the Yes Bank, and he is saying that if you have deferred the main payment, if you have deferred the interest of the main payment, you should also defer the interest which is there. So if if that case goes through, so this interest will also go through. All right. All right. Thank you so much, Advocate Burkett. Thank you so much. So I have a uh, open question for all the speakers. Uh, this is pertaining to labor laws of employment. Few employers association have filed a petition against the notices issued by the government of India. Uh, can uh, so can employers not to uh, to not to terminate when it is difficult to run the company itself. I mean, the question is bit. Uh, uh, the question is like break into two parts. So the in simplified form. So uh, the uh, em, like the employees has filed a petition and uh, like to government of India. I mean, like they cannot file a petition to government of India. If I'm just correct me, please. If I'm wrong. So uh, I can answer you over there uh, uh, in, please, this, please. In, in this aspect. So what sure. I was telling on uh, that 
a week before there is a case in the supreme court of india wherein people have come up before the supreme court of india seeking the funds which has been created under the pm care fund to mm-hmm. be utilized for the payment which has to be done to the employees of such employers who are facing lockdown complete lockdown or okay. are facing some sort of difficulties like for example if there is a banquet hall so banquet right. hall is not working because because no marriages can happen similarly if there is a if someone is into travel industry so nobody is going to travel because of this lockdown similarly if there is someone who is into the manufacturing so nothing no manufacturing plant is working because of the lo- because of this lockdown so that case has come up before the supreme court of india saying that you ensure that these money which you are saying that employers will not terminate anyone so we we have no other option with ourselves except to terminate or ex- okay except to ask them to work for free for these 3 months when we are not getting anything in these 3 months so if you are saying that no termination you also ensure that we have those money with ourselves so that we can pay to the to the mm-hmm. employees so that's how that case has come up before the supreme court of india now let's see okay. which way it goes if someone wins that case if that if union of mm-hmm. india agrees that yes we will will release the fund which we have with ourselves in the pm care fund for mm-hmm. this thing only so the issue is resolved i think the okay. issue is resolved and just okay. to add to that uh, this is neeraj uh, yeah. another case supreme court on 27th of april uh, also ruled on the legality of the orders issued by ministry of uh, home affairs and uh, direct which directed the private enterprises to pay full wages Mm-hmm. and the court refused to stay the said orders uh, upholding its applicability to even private establishments in the current situ- situation which means that uh, the orders pertaining to full payment of salaries without deductions will come okay. will com- continue to apply during the entire period of lockdown all right all right sir uh, thank you so much so one more question uh what happen if we can't able to pay the complete salaries of the employees and the and the staff due to no sales and debt burden on the company so can i answer that question sahil please 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 sure sure so that uh, if if you are not able to pay that money so uh, there was an issue in respect to two questions in res- uh, f- from the uh, from the corporate organization from to the ministry of home affairs that one that what if we do not pay two mm-hmm. what if someone is found suffering from covid 19 and you make us liable for that right okay someone is who knows how he gets affected if, if uh, gets uh, infected out uh, on covid 19 and then you make a blame that you, we asked you to come to the question to to manufacturing plants or to the offices and then somehow he contacted some some disease and then some some person who was carrying this disease and ultimately he also got suffered so these were the two very specific questions from the uh, from the corporate side that what if we do not pay and what if what if if someone is suffering from covid 19 in, in at our place so both to uh, one question has been answered very specifically by the ministry of Co- uh, home affairs that if someone is found suffering from covid 19 we are not going to punish you very clearly as far as the second question is concerned ki what if we don't pay so the ministry of home affairs and the uh, and the finance report which i was reading it says that we will don't worry about the gratuity don't worry about the provident fund so we will pay the entire provident fund of 24% on your behalf we will pay the entire gratuity also you just take care of the money which you are supposed to pay if you are not able to pay that will be a tricky situation when someone will come up before the court saying that your lord say i have not been paid how will i run my business and how will i run my household chores and so on so forth that is why this case which is which i was discussing before the court uh, before the forum that there is a case before supreme court of india wherein people are asking that the pm care fund should be used for that particular purpose only is very crucial to figure it out that how and when that is to be used and in what manner that is to be used and ensuring that every business keeps on running because at the end of the day businesses runs the economy and if businesses are not running the economy will not run and the economy will not run then everyone is doomed everyone is doomed 
so i think there is a genuineness and there is some merit in that particular suit which has been filed before the supreme court of india seeking funds from the pm care fund only to disburse the salary to to the employees but uh, let's see how things goes on all right all right sir so any uh, any question from the audience any more questions so i guess one question is received how to digitalize the agreements uh this is for advocate pulkit i suppose how to because after that only uh, so how to digitalize the agreements in that regard so uh, so there is a very easy way to digitalize the agreements everyone use ms word be mm -hmm. it on the mac or be it on the windows or anywhere else to right. draft the agreement and then we take it up we take the print out and then we go and sign it off so instead of taking a print out you use the digital signature certificate to put your signature over that and agreement is digitalized okay so i guess there is no rocket science in that yeah. just uh, we you just put it like use the digital signature rather than putting your signature by yourself so amazing so i guess uh, one more question so again mr polkit lic premiums of march can be paid by when uh, and that can be paid uh, in next 30 days next 30 okay. days so that has been for the that will, that was supposed to be paid till today it may be extended mm -hmm. because the lockdown is going to extend so i think that new notification will come and i okay. believe that uh, you'll get another 60 days to pay all right for the premium right. which was due in march okay so any more questions guys any more question i hope uh like there are no more questions and maximum questions has been answered so yeah uh, so in case uh, you want to reach out to any of the speaker you can just go to the www.lawyer.in and uh, find a lawyer you will find the profile of advocate pulkit prakash advocate neeraj tope advocate prerna abroy skr associates and advocate angad mehta or you can reach out to sonali and sonali would be happy to provide us with your any further queries and uh, the advocates will be you know most happy to answer them and also you have an option to book a meeting with them by just uh, you know book a calendar with them on their profile and accordingly you can have a discussion with them over the call or a video call as per your convenience and i hope you all are keeping safe and making sure that uh, you are not moving out of the houses so in case you have any further queries feel free to reach out thank you so much uh, thank you sonali now i would like to hand over to you again thank you so much it was um, it was an amazing session thank you so much thank you so much sahil and thank you so much for uh, to all our speakers thank you for taking out the time and being so patient and answering each and every question by the attendees that doesn't happen often to be honest <laughs> so thank you so much and thank you so much to all the attendees uh, uh, for taking out the time to attend this webinar we hope we were able to add some value to your lives uh, so yes uh, if there are no further questions uh, i guess we'll wrap up now yeah yeah that that's fine thank, thank you, you so, so much, much. yeah bye Please, take care uh, reach bye out to me if you have any uh, questions at all uh, related to any of the speakers and i'll make sure your message goes to them if you need the recording of the session again please mail me uh, on the same mail that you received the confirmation message on so i'll be able to provide the recording as well and yeah thank you so much please view our upcoming webinars uh, in uh, again all the details will again be mailed to you for our upcoming webinars we have another one tomorrow which is about keeping your company afloat during covid-19 crisis so if you are interested in that again please reach out to me thank you sonali okay. and Mr. thank you sonali thank, thank you so, so much thank you so much and thank you to all my friends thanks guys here, Bye -bye. including mr pulkit and mr neeraj prerna and other speaker thank you everyone yes. Thank you sir thank you thank you thank you sir thank, thank you, you sir thank you thank you so much